Today on The Hookup, we're going to learn how to pick the right microcontroller for your project by examining the different pin modes available on the ESP8266 and the ESP32 based Node MCUs. Microcontrollers have four major pin modes in the Arduino IDE. Digital inputs, digital outputs, analog inputs, and analog outputs. Not every pin can do every job, and each microcontroller has a specific number of pins that will be able to be used with each of these pin modes. Your specific project needs will determine the best microcontroller for your project. Today, we're going to use the Node MCU version of the ESP8266 and ESP32 because they happen to be my favorite and they're readily available on Amazon. But there are hundreds of board variants based on these two chips with only slight differences. The first major pin mode we're going to look at is the digital input. A digital input will give us a value of either 0 or 1 when using the digital read function. When a pin on the node MCU is connected to a ground or a voltage under 0.8 volts, it will return a zero. And when it's exposed to a voltage over 2.4 volts, it will return one. Anywhere in between 0.8 and 2.4 volts, and you won't reliably be able to predict the pin reading. It's worth noting that a zero can be represented in your code by the words false or low, and a one can be represented by the values true or high. But the correct voltage is only half the battle. Imagine you've got a pin set up as an input and it's connected to a switch that's off. That pin is neither grounded, which means pulled low, or exposed to voltage, which means pulled high. This type of pin is called a floating pin and will basically just return random values based on how much electrical interference is present around it. Floating pins are bad and you should prevent them by either using a pull down resistor or a pull-up resistor. A pull-up resistor will make the default state of a pin high by connecting a high value resistor from the GPIO pin to the 3.3 volt power source on the node MCU. If you were to connect the other side of your switch to ground, then switching it on would cause the pin to go from high to low, and you can program the rest of your sketch accordingly. A pull-down resistor does exactly the opposite by giving a default state of low by connecting a high value resistor from the GPIO pin to the ground. If you were using a pull down resistor, you'd want to connect the other end of your switch to the 3.3 volt source, which would cause your pin to go from low to high. On the ESP8266 based node MCU, we can define most GPIO pins as input pull ups, and it will use a built in resistor to pull that pin high. The only pins you can't use input pull ups on are pin 16 and pin 15, which makes sense because in my last video we determined that pulling pin 15 high during the boot process would cause it to fail. And pin 16 is a special pin and it's the only pin on the ESP8266 to have a pull down resistor. The input pull down function is actually so specific to pin 16 that instead of just typing input pull down for the pin mode, you actually type in input pull down 16. On the ESP32 based node MCU, almost all the pins can be used as either input pull ups or input pull downs. But there are a few exceptions. Steer clear of pins 6 through 11 because they will prevent the board from booting if used as an input. Pin 34 through 39 don't work with the input pull up, and pins 0 through 3 don't work with an input pull down. There are plenty of other pins available, so just skip those altogether. To set up a digital input, you'll use one of these three different pin modes in your sketches setup section. Now that we've covered the best pins for the digital inputs, let's explore digital outputs. A digital output pin will output 3.3 volts when the digital write high function is used, and it will output zero volts, or act as a ground, when the digital write low function is used. In accordance with my last video, we want to avoid any pin that will output voltage during the boot process because that can cause unexpected behavior in your projects. On the ESP8266 based node MCU, this eliminates pin 1, 2, 3, 9, 10, and 16. And to be safe, we probably also want to eliminate the pins that can't be grounded on boot, since the device that we output to often provides enough of a ground to cause problems. So that eliminates pin 0. That leaves us with just six pins as viable outputs, which isn't a whole lot. 
If you need more outputs, you might want to consider using the ESP32. We'll do the same thing on the ESP32 and eliminate the pins that are high on boot. Then we'll eliminate the pins that output a small PWM signal on boot. We'll throw out the pins that can't be grounded on boot. Oh, and by the way, pins 34 through 39 can't be outputs, even though they're GPIO, which means general purpose input output. Even after that, we're left with 15 pins that are great candidates for output, more than twice the amount of the ESP8266. To set up a digital output on both boards, all you need to do is put in pin mode, pin, and output into your setup section. Next, let's look at analog inputs. An analog input uses a circuit called an analog to digital converter, or ADC, to allow for specific voltages between 0 and about 3.3 volts to be interpreted by the microcontroller. The ADC on the Node MCU ESP8266 by default has a 10-bit resolution, which means that using the analog read function will return a value between 0 and 1024 based on the input voltage. If we take 3.3 volts and we divide it by 1024, you can see this allows us to differentiate between voltages of around 3.2 millivolts. The ESP8266 based node MCU has a single ADC pin and it's located on A0. So if you're looking to utilize multiple analog sensors, you're gonna either need to add an external multiplexer or look at using a different board. To set up an analog input in your code, all you have to do is type in pin mode A0 input in your setup and then you'd call analog read on that same pin in your code. The ESP32 based node MCU has eight ADC channels on pins 32 through 39, but only six of them are actually usable since pins 37 and 38 aren't actually exposed from the chip to the header pins. By default, the ESP32 has 12-bit resolution, meaning analog read will return a value from 0 to 4096. If we divide 3.3 by 4096, you can see that this gives us a resolution of 0.8 millivolts using this ADC. To set up the analog pins on the ESP32, it's exactly the same as the ESP8266, but instead of writing A0, you'll use one of these pins. Last, we'll cover analog outputs. Analog outputs come in two different flavors, pulse width modulation, PWM, and the digital to analog converter, or a DAC. The ESP8266 based node MCU does not have a DAC, so it's limited to only PWM. A PWM signal basically turns on and off the 3.3 volt signal rapidly to simulate other voltages. For a more detailed explanation of PWM, check out my dimmable LED ceiling light video. The ESP8266 based node MCU uses its processor to generate PWM signals, and any pin can be used as a PWM pin by calling the analog write function. The ESP8266 will default to a frequency of 1000 Hz unless you change it using the analog write freak function. Because it's a processor based PWM signal, it often has to drop the frequency of its signal if the processor gets overloaded. Unfortunately, the ESP8266 processor is not exactly a powerhouse, so even moderate Wi-Fi traffic can cause PWM frequency throttling. The ESP32 is clearly superior when it comes to analog output. Not only does it handle its PWM generation independent from the main processor, which means no throttling, but it also has a true DAC which means that it doesn't just simulate different voltages by outputting a PWM signal, it can actually output different voltages between 0 and 3.2 volts. The downside to the ESP32 is that the analog write function hasn't been implemented yet, which means in order to utilize the PWM functionality, you need to use something called the LEDC function. To do this, you need to first set up an LEDC channel using the LEDC setup function where you specify the hardware channel, the frequency, and the resolution. This would set up an LEDC channel on channel 1 with a frequency of 500 Hz and an 8-bit resolution. Remember that an 8-bit resolution means you're going to assign it values between 0 and 256 for the duty cycle. Again, for a more detailed explanation of PWM, check out my dimmable LED ceiling light video. After you've set up the PWM channel, you just need to tell it which pin to output to using the LEDC attach pin function, where you first specify the pin to output to and then the LEDC channel to attach. So here, we're assigning channel 1 to pin 32. Once the pin is set up, you change the duty cycle using a function 
called LEDC write. This can be confusing because you're going to use the LEDC channel in the function, not the pin it's attached to. So this would set our PWM signal on pin 32 to a duty cycle of 50%. If you don't want to use PWM and you actually want to output a specific voltage, you can use the ESP32's Digital to Analog Converter, or DAC, and it's located on pins 25 and 26. To use this feature, you'll use the function DAC write. The value can be between 0 and 255, so we'd expect 128 to give us approximately 1.6 volts, which is half of the 3.2 volt max voltage. You can see that the ESP32 is a much more sophisticated chip, so why wouldn't you pick it? Number one, it's a little more expensive, and number two, there are much fewer libraries available for the Arduino IDE on the ESP32 than there are on the ESP8266. If you're going to use an ESP32, you may end up with some problems finding the libraries that you want to use. So there you have it, an explanation of the most commonly used features on the ESP8266 and the ESP32 based node MCUs. I've made diagrams for all the things I've discussed in this video and they're posted down in the video description. I know this video was a bit on the technical side, but I'm planning on doing a few project videos in the near future that will use some of these functions. So I wanted to make this video first to explain my design choices. The summer is over and school is back in session, which means I'm back to my day job. I'm still gonna try to release new, high quality content once a week on Wednesdays. I've recently set up a Patreon page where I'll be sharing my configuration.yaml file and my node red flows. If you're interested in supporting my channel in that way, please head over and check it out. Remember that using the Amazon links in the description also helps support my channel. I've also launched a website that has transcripts of each of my videos and some other information like links to the tools that I use for my electronics projects. Finally, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, please consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.